Good morning, great souls. We are continuing with our fireside chats. Today we're going to be talking about Sri Yukteswar. So let us begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master, Paramhansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, Dearest friend Swami Kriyananda, Humbly we bow to you all. Help us to understand your divine guidance, your wisdom. Show us the path that leads to freedom. Give us the courage and the clarity of mind to persevere against all obstacles, to feel your presence calling us ever closer to the infinite light that is our own nature. We are your children. Comfort and bless us. Om. Peace. Amen. So now we're going to talk about Sri Yukteswar. We're, we're moving through the masters here. Sri Yukteswar is one of the better known of our masters because so much of autobiography of a yogi is devoted to master's experiences with him. And master presents him and uh, we sort of tend to feel him as a, a rather more stern figure, a rather more demanding figure. Master himself describes him that way. It's very interesting in autobiography that Master makes no attempt um, to make Sri Yukteswar other than he is. And he talks about his stern dis- discipline and his um, frank and straightforward way of speaking. And he said if he had been you know, less of that way, he would have been the most popular guru <laughs> of his time. But because he... Uh, work so strenuously, uh, he could only take those who really had the commitment to work as hard as he did. Also, in some context, and I think it's either an autobiography or maybe in the path, the, the question is raised that Sri Yukteswar's primary role in this lifetime, although he trained other disciples as well, and there are other lineages that flow through Sri Yukteswar's disciples, for the most part he didn't have many that the real purpose of his life was to come and to train Yogananda, and then through Master coming to the West, writing Autobiography of a Yogi, uh, bringing Sri Yukteswar to the attention of the world, because everybody who reads that book, the millions of people who read that book, it's really more about everyone else than it is about Master. And one of the primary ones it's about is Sri Yukteswar. And it's interesting that the relationship with Sri Yukteswar would be so demanding because discipleship was one of the primary things that Master came to bring. When I first started this series, I was talking about the first sentence of Autobiography of a Yogi is the disciple-guru relationship. And then we have the story of Sri Yukteswar, of Master, all through his youth, you know, longing to, to meet his guru and then the extraordinary meeting in the narrow lane of Varanasi, where um, Master saw him for the first time, knelt at his feet and, and writes, you know, this was not the first son, this was not the first day that um, had witnessed m- m- my being at the feet of my Master. Um, it's interesting that their meeting also took place in Varanasi because Sri Yukteswar was a disciple of Lahiri. Sri Yukteswar's mother lived in Varanasi, and of course his guru lived in Varanasi. So he was he was there, and Yogananda was there attending at that time, living in a an ashram that he had gone to after high school that was not satisfactory for him, but nonetheless it was the, the place that he had chosen to be. And so all of those circumstances come together because in fact Sri Yukteswar's home place was quite near Calcutta, which is where Master lived, but they had to come to Varanasi. 
They had to come to the feet of Sri Teshwar in order, I mean, of, of where Lahiri was. Lahiri had already passed, I'm not speaking truthfully, when uh, Sri Yukteswar was in Varanasi. He'd come primarily to see his mother. Um, we have this very austere picture of Sri Yukteswar that's described, but I had the privilege of meeting um, Master's nephew, Hare Krishna Ghosh, during our early trips to India. He lived into the 90s, Hare Krishna did. And when he was uh, a child, Sri Yukteswar, who was a guru bai of his father, both um, of his grandfather, um, Master's father and Sri Yukteswar were both disciples of Lahiri Mahashaya. And so once they discovered each other, often disciples of Lahiri Mahashaya didn't know that they shared a guru because Lahiri had them all keep their spiritual lives so private. But once that, uh, Master's father and Sri Yukteswar knew that they were both disciples. Sri Yukteswar would often come and visit the house. And Hare Krishna Ghosh described him as being quite fond of children and actually quite merry. That he would he would put uh, candies in his pockets and he would invite the children to examine his pockets and try to find find the candies. He would tease the children. And he also talked about how he had this big bulbous nose that he used to sometimes twiddle like this. But they used to look forward to Sri Yukteswar's visits, far from considering him some kind of a stern character. He was a, a jolly uncle for the children of the house, which <clears throat> just puts forward the necessity for us not to make out of any of these characters cardboard characters. What happens over time, and I've spoke about this earlier in this in this conversations, is that the, the, the multidimensional humanity of a master gets lost in the legend of their spiritual greatness. And on one hand, you, well, it's almost inevitable, and you might even think it's a good thing. <clears throat> but what happens is, the more we do that, the more distant they become from our actual own, our, our own experience, and the less useful they become as real examples of what it is to live a spiritual life. In the book that I've written, <clears throat> which many of you know, Light Bearer about Swami Kriyananda, one of the things I tried very hard to do was to help people who are reading that book realize that, and this is the word I've often used, that when a great soul, and Swami was not an avatar, but he was, a, a, he, he was liberated in that lifetime, he became free, um, he they fully commit themselves to the human experience. They may choose a personality in a way that they're going to relate to it, but that doesn't mean that they are aloof from it, and especially it does not mean that they're two-dimensional. And interesting facts about Sri Yukteswar's life, which are only relevant in this context, is that he was married and that he raised a daughter. And in fact, when he was at the Kumbha Mela and Babaji called him Swami, Sri Yukteswar goes to the Kumbha Mela. Babaji speaks to him as Swami. Sri Yukteswar says, <clears throat> but sir, I'm not. I'm not a renunciate. And Babaji says to him, those upon whom I um, confer this title, you know, it is, it is God's will that they should have it. And so he actually started calling himself Swami. This um, Jayadev in Assisi did some research on this, putting all the dates together. He was called Swami while he was still married. And um, Jayadev did the research on this, and it's an, sort of a, a little coda to the book, A Renunciate Order for the New Age. Because one of the things that Swami Kriyananda did when he set up the Naya Swami order is that he initiated married couples as full sannyasis without requiring that they separate and dissolve their marriage. The, the first night when Swami was talking to some of us in Assisi the day that Divine Mother gave him a miraculous healing and he um, started talking about that order. I was, remember sitting there and Shivani and Arjuna, who have been married since 1974, were sitting in the room and Shivani in a very small voice said, is it necessary for us to leave our marriages in order to be sannyasis? And Swami so sweetly said, I don't see any reason why you would have to do that. 
And it was very touching because you could see that Shivani was ready to do whatever was necessary. But it was also greatly reassuring and, and restful to be told, no, that's not necessary. You can become saints together, which is how the Italian saint spoke to Swami Kriyananda and Rosanna when they were contemplating getting married. No, they weren't contemplating getting married. The saint told them that they could marry if they wanted to. Become saints together is how she put it. So Lahiri Mahashaya was married and Sri Yukteswar was married. And Babaji conferred upon him the title of a Swami and he began to use it um, during, during the time that his wife was still living. Eventually, his wife passed away and his daughter was married. And then his daughter also predeceased him, but she was married and taken care of. And then he officially took sannyas and became a sannyasi at that point and became Swami Sri Yukteswar at that point. But his personality was, was quite um, detached from the things of this world. He was austere. He was austere by temperament. He, had, he practiced vairagya as his natural temperament. He had a disinclination for the things of this world. But he was, he was practical, and he took his family property. This is all described in Autobiography of a Yogi. He, he arranged his life so that his income came from the property he had inherited, and it was, he was never required to take a job. Lahiri Mahashaya entered into life so completely he took a, a government job. He worked steadily at that job for decades of his life. He raised multiple children. His wife outlived him. He had a small house that belonged to the family. Sri so Yukteswar had a householder period, but it was, it was earlier before he really comes on the scene of being one of our masters. By the time a uh, uh, master meets him, Sri Yukteswar is established in his rather austere renunciate life. And later on, in Autobiography of a Yogi, they have this picture of, of Master being back there in 1935, having returned um, to see his guru for the last time, having been summoned by his guru to India, actually, inwardly summoned. And he's there, and he wants to, he wants to give to his master, and he offers to buy him a new rug, you know, to just make his, his uh, life more attractive and more uh, refined. And Sri Yukteswar just sort of, and I always have this picture in my mind that of Sri Yukteswar kind of peering out at Master, and I, it feels to me like he's looking at him from a long distance. And he says, you know, my, my asana, my bed, my meditation blanket, it's all fine. And, you know, why would I replace something just to make it more beautiful? And he, he says to Master, that's your world, like that, just that's your world. Because when Master came to America, there was no possibility that he could live in Los Angeles in the style that Sri Yukteswar could live in Sarampore and in Puri. It just um, wouldn't be understood. Swami Kriyananda, actually, we had to go through that evolution in the course of our time at Ananda. Um, because we were profoundly impoverished for many, many years. You know, I would say to people that I didn't really have any money. And that didn't mean that all I had was my savings account or all I had was my, uh, you know, my inheritance or this. And at that point, there was none of that. I had a jar. And uh, Swami would pay me $50 in cash and I would put it into the jar and then I would take it out as I needed it. $50 was a lot more than it is now. And my home, which was this trailer that I'd paid $150 for, was completely paid for. I had no car. I had no insurance of any kind. So really, literally, all I had to buy was propane and food. And somehow or another, it always worked. And of course, Divine Mother gave me things. And to be honest, my parents were not wealthy, but they were comfortable. So I, I never had the slightest thought. If I had actually desperately needed anything, I could have appealed to them. So I wasn't really um, I live dependent on God, but I wasn't really alone in the world. I mean, what to speak of Ananda itself. But nonetheless, I loved being impoverished. And what I was going to talk about was Swami. Swami, we, he had a car. I think 
on that particular, it, we, we finally got a car for him. He had various cars, but finally we got um, access to a, to a, an arm, a, a, a military, a, a military auction where they were selling surplus goods. That's what it was. And there was this, uh, I'm going to go in like this because it was sort of big. It was a, I think it was a Ford Chevrolet. It was a Chevrolet. It was a big blue Chevrolet. Those big old cars, you know, that before gasoline was an issue, they're just not fancy, but just big, a big family car. And we bought two of them for $75 each because one of them, the mechanic cannibalized for parts and the other one Swami drove and it had been painted over, but faintly it said Air Force on the side. So he always called that blue car Air Force One, <laughs> but it was old. It was old for the time, but it ran well. It was very spacious. We could take six, uh, five people traveling and had a big trunk. It was perfect. So Swamiji goes down to a, a meeting of the Ways event in San Francisco, which is this convocation of multiple spiritual leaders that happened even every few months for a while during those years. This is the 70s. And he was invited to a, a reception for all the teachers at somebody's big mansion somewhere in San Francisco. And I was part of his traveling party, and I went. We arrived a little bit late, and we had a little trouble finding a parking place. And there were all these cars there. There were um, Mercedes, several limousines, there were Cadillacs, there were actually even Rolls Royces, and then other really fine cars. And then we drove up in our $75 car and had to find a place to park it and went inside. And after we got inside, Swami made, after, I mean, afterwards, Swami made a very interesting statement. He said, I have to get a new car. He said, in India, they would respect me for driving a car that, that, that is this old and this cheap. He said, in America, and this was the interesting phrase, where money is so much easier to come by, he said, people will think that if I have to drive a car that's that cheap, there's something wrong with the teachings. Because if my teachings were valid, then I would be able to acquire more pros physical prosperity. So he, he went shopping for a car, and as it happened, well, it was a humorous thing, we thought someone had donated $40,000 to him. So he had electricity brought into his house and he bought all this recording equipment and he went out and bought this new car. And it turned out the donation was for $4,000. <laughs> that was one of Seymour's shining moments. Sir, he told me on the phone that the donor, they were sending a check and she heard 40 and he actually said four. She said, I made a mistake with a zero here. Swami just laughed. He thought it was Divine Mother's way of just playing games with him. So he had to go out and do some lectures to earn the money, which is what he would do to earn money. But he bought this cash, this car. And so he was looking at different cars. And the car he really liked, he had arthritic hips, and uh, it, he needed comfort. So the car he liked, I believe it was a big Buick of some kind, and it was wonderfully comfortable, and it was really good for Swami. But the pamphlets about it, he said all the people looked egoic and proud. And he just, he, he realized that that was, the, that was the impression that car would give, that I finally arrived, that I'm important in the world because I drive this car. And he just, he just did not want to be part of that. You see how sensitive he was? And I'm talking about Sri Yukteswar, but I'm talking about the concept because I know more about Swami. Swami just he was going to do what he needed to do, but he wasn't going to buy into any of that. He said, they all just look so egoic. He said, I don't want to be like them. So he compromised and he bought a Ford, I think is what he bought. Now, I might have that, you know what? I've mixed up several stories because the business of the Buick came a little bit later because he bought a Nissan at that point. So I'm just going to, that, that actually happened, but it was actually a little bit later. At this time, Swami just went to the dealer and he bought a Ford. And it was a very classic design. It's like you couldn't quite tell whether it was expensive or not expensive. But he bought this very comfortable Ford because it was just the right level for what, what he needed to do. And then there was a time at Ananda itself. And this was in 1977 when Swami went to India to be in seclusion to write the path. And... and he, the, his seclusion house, no, excuse me, after he'd written the path, he went there to, he went all, he, he went around the world. He was gone for six months and he took two months of seclusion in India and his friend, Suffering Moses, had provided a house for him in Kashmir, but the house wasn't available for several weeks. So Swami had several weeks 
when he was just living in Kashmir in another place, but couldn't start his seclusion. And so he spent a lot of time with his host, who was Suffering Moses, who was, is a, a name long-suffering because he was a craftsman. And then Swami starts seeing all these Indian crafts, these hand, this handmade Indian furniture, and he decides to buy a whole, like half a house full, whole dining room and living room of this hand-carved walnut furniture, which is still in Crystal Hermitage. It's all in Crystal Hermitage. We are living in trailers, and and the community has burned down recently, so we're having to rebuild it. And and our question of simple living is: Does simple living do you betray the principles of simple living if you have indoor plumbing? That's the conversation we're having. You know, if you can drive a car closer than a hundred yards to your house, I mean, is that a violation of simple living? I mean, what to speak of electricity? It was just. Like that was our conversation. Swami, Swami is sending writing to me because I was his his secretary then. He's writing to me from India, and he's could he have sent me photographs? I can't. I'm, I don't know how he would have sent photographs in those days, but somehow maybe he sent pictures of these hand carved walnut chairs and this hand carved walnut uh, couch and this this dining room set for twelve with a small table that could also be a kitchen table and the screen and how Suffering Moses is going to, to have it all custom made for him. And could I find $7,000, which was like nothing for all that furniture, but still it was $7,000, which I did manage to find for him because there were people who would, who would support anything he wanted. Like, where are we going to put this, Swamiji? But this is when he writes to us, and this is all actually about Sri Yukteswar, so I have to, and I will have to obviously go on tomorrow. But he said, quite simply, when people come to Ananda, they need to, to immediately feel that these are refined people. He said, they need, he said, we do not want a luxurious atmosphere. We do not want it to look like luxury, but we want it to look refined. And beauty is a very important part of how you express. If you have a sense of beauty, if you have a sense of harmony, Swami later wrote that book, Space, Light, and Harmony, about building crystal hermitage. Because how you present yourself and what your environment looks like tells people what your consciousness is. In this community that I live in here in Palo Alto, when we, when this property was first purchased by a group of private investors for us to use as a community, it was um, it was very dark, and the people who lived here, their idea of what they wanted their environment to be was dark. You know, dark furniture, dark walls, the the curtains drawn even in the daytime. Just everything was dark and not at all beautiful. And I don't mean this to be in a prejudicial way, but it was it was a place where the police had to come. You know, several times a week because of fights or illicit activity. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't beyond redemption, but it was just people were living. They came from an astral world in which the dominant color was brown. We came from an astral world in which the colors were pink and lavender and blue and magenta. just like. And so they created their astral world. And after they moved out, we repainted and opened the windows and made it look like our astral world. And so Swamiji said, when people come to Ananda, they need to feel immediately, these are refined people. Because if our environment is refined, then they will, be, they will assume our ideas are refined. If our environment is not refined, they won't be able necessarily to see past that to our, our ideas. This is the West. This is not India. In India, it's just remarkable. You go even to very... I mean, it's, it's changing, but you would go even to the best ashrams. I mean, the most well-respected ashrams, and just everything was utilitarian. There was just no uh, no inclination on the part of the sadhus to invest in this world. So, masters coming to the West, it was it was a Dwapara Yuga change, because also you see this is a shift from Kali into Dwapara, where in Dwapara um, you can integrate the worlds, whereas in Kali. You had to keep the worlds, the spirit and the and the world completely separate. They just this uh, material was so dense, so gross 
that you just couldn't integrate it, you had to repudiate it. But now we're into a time of integrating these realities. So Swami bought all this furniture and we had it shipped and there was no place at Ananda Village to put it, just simply no place. And just by God's own timing, <clears throat> the San Francisco house started, which was a 45-room mansion in Pacific Heights, and with these all these huge rooms that had to be furnished. So all of the Indian furniture, or most of it, just went into that house and was used there for a number of years until Crystal Hermitage was remodeled and there was room for it. Some of it just stayed in cartons, just stayed in cartons for years until we had a place for it. But Swami knew exactly what he was doing, and that furniture, 30, 40 years later now, you know, defines Crystal Hermitage. He knew, he knew what he was looking for. Now, I'm coming all the way back to where Sri Yukteswar says to Master, when Master just wants to buy him a rug, Sri Yukteswar says, that's your world. And what he meant by that, he wasn't chastising Master for being worldly or materialistic. That was ridiculous. But it is your job to relate to the world. Sri Yukteswar's job was not to relate to the world particularly. He sat in his ashram. He greeted people. He, he, he served. Um, Swami said later that one of the reasons Sri Yukteswar you know, had the sharp tongue that he had and the, 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 the precise manner that he had, the demanding nature, was because he, he didn't want to pick up any more disciples is how it was it was put that he he was there he was there for a purpose and in in the autobiography of a yogi it says you know when he left this world when he passed out of this physical body as Sri Yukteswar he went to Hiranyaloka which is a very advanced causal astral world where Sri Yukteswar said people are more easily able to meet my standards and so Perhaps just given his nature, given his inclination, that was a, a more congenial environment for him to um, to serve. I, you know, it, it conjures up this extraordinary complexity of what is the world beyond this one like? What what is really happening um, in uh, in creation? What is really happening with these masters? We get this little sort of ownership idea like, you know, my Sri Yukteswar, as if they were born just for us. Well, that's the paradox of the whole thing, you see. Swamiji often says, we think of omnipresence as being, you know, present in infinity. But um, he said, if you're in the infinite, if you're, if you're infinite, you're also infinitesimal. So even the smallest aspect of creation is equally populated by the life of an avatar. This is um, Sister Gyanamata wrote a letter to Master that was so touching, and I, I'm not quoting it, but this is the sense of it. She wrote saying, I know that you have a world-changing Master and that Babaji, you know, you came here representing Babaji and the other Masters and you, your, your, your mission will, will change the course of history. She writes that. And then she says, but I like to think you came just for me. And Master endorsed that sentiment because in a very real sense he did. Because all of this enormous effort actually comes down soul by soul. Because it doesn't serve anything to build great monuments in this world. It doesn't serve anything to have a beautiful house full of beautiful furniture. The the only the only lasting reality is individual self realization so every master comes every every saint uh, every teacher comes for one reason which is to help individual souls move closer to the divine so all of master's enormous mission actually comes down to you me and everyone whose lives he touched and it's it's perfectly fair and much welcomed by the Guru for us to realize that we are loved and that we are treasured individually and that the Master individually rejoices with us when we move closer to God. So 
you know, we have this whole story of these gurus, which we can just barely glimpse the edge of who and what they are. And as a consequence, I'll talk more about Sri Yukteswar tomorrow. God bless you.